Our last couple of episodes have all been pointing into a distinct and clear direction – a change in the strategic situation of the Pacific War. With the conclusion of the battles for Guadalcanal and Bunagona, both the Allies and the Japanese had to meet to discuss what their new plans for the future would be. The reorganization of American and Japanese forces and tactics eventually culminated with the start of Operation Ego, a massive air offensive in the South Pacific. But as this was happening, other important events were transpiring elsewhere, particularly in the Aleutian Islands and Burma. Join us today as we cover the end of Operation Longcloth, the first Chindits expedition under Brigadier Wingate, and the direct aftermath of the important Battle of the Komondorsky Islands. Hey history fans, as you know, the YouTube algorithm precludes us from releasing more than three or four videos per week, as the more we release, the lower the average views are, which hurts the overall standing of the channel in search rankings and such. Still, we produce more videos than that, and we want to give our viewers a chance to watch them. Videos are now published as YouTube member and Patreon exclusives. For just $5 per month, yes, one cup of coffee, you'll get access to 25 new videos. Currently, we're running two battle series, the Peloponnesian Wars and the Italian Unification Wars. Click the link in the description or pinned comment, and you'll get exclusive videos, early access to all videos, learn our schedule, get access to our private Discord, watch our behind-the-scenes videos, and much more. Thank you for watching and your kind support. We wouldn't be able to do what we love without you. This episode first takes us to the North Pacific, where Admirals Kincaid and McNorris had scored a decisive naval victory back on March 27th. The Battle of the Komondorsky Islands would prove to be the end of the Japanese naval supremacy in the North Pacific, as no further Japanese convoys would reach the Aleutians until the end of the campaign. Thus, the success of Kincaid's daring blockade had sealed the fate of the Japanese garrisons at Kiska and Attu. Yet before any invasion plans could be drawn up, Admiral Kincaid and General Buckner needed to secure their advanced bases and work the remaining bugs in their war machinery. One of their first major joint decisions would be to move the Army, Navy and Air Force headquarters out to Adak, a thousand miles nearer the enemy. Soon Adak would become the center of the frenzy, growing into an important naval base. Supply was still an outstanding problem for the American ground forces, and this further harmed morale of the troops and caused an important medical problem. As for the Navy, the North Pacific Submarine Force spent the first few months of Kincaid's command healing its wounds, gathering its strength for the final push, and running routine patrols, although with no memorable actions that could be recounted. A new PT boat squadron also had to be assembled, employing the Higgins model, which was fitted with hot air heaters. Because the previous squadron had been severely handicapped by the gruesome North Pacific weather, losing half of the PT boats back in January. The 11th Air Force of General Butler, meanwhile, lost 11 planes to the weather in January, and so bad was the weather that only a handful of missions would be carried out. In February, more missions could thankfully be launched, but nearly half of them made impotent runs over Kiska because of the constant crippling failures of Bombay rack mechanisms, which froze when caked with corrosion and ice. The drop in efficiency of the bomber missions also coincided with the temporary leave of the fearless Colonel Erickson, who was replaced by Colonel Earl de Ford as Chief of Bomber Command. De Ford took matters personally at hand, and thus he would often come into conflict with some of Erickson's ideas, which were still being upheld by his former men. As we'll recall, Admiral Kincaid had begun planning the invasion of Kiska upon assuming command submitting a general plan that would then be approved by Admiral Nimitz, General DeWitt and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Though DeWitt had recommended the 35th Division of Major General Charles Corlett, which had already been involved in the occupation of Adak under the experienced General Landrum, Washington would instead assign the 7th Motorized Division for the invasion. Commanded by Major General Albert Brown, the Hourglass Division had been trained for desert fighting in North Africa since the start of the war, and as neither tanks, trucks, nor armoured or desert tactics would be of any use in the Aleutians, 
the division had to be retrained as an Arctic amphibious division in a period of three months. Thankfully, amphibious assault specialists, such as Major General Holland Smith, and men accustomed to the Aleutian theater, such as Colonels Kastner and Eriksson, would be sent in January to start the retraining of the 7th Division. By February, however, Washington had assigned an insufficient number of ships for the invasion of Kiska. Thus, at the end of the month, Kincaid came up with a brilliant idea – to bypass Kiska and use the available shipping strength and a regimental group to hit the lightly defended Atu, leaving Kiska completely surrounded and hopefully forcing the Japanese to evacuate it. This new plan, codenamed Operation Landcrab and under the command of Vice Admiral Francis Rockwell, was immediately approved, and on April 1st, all major commanders of the theater would meet in a conference at San Diego to iron out the final details. Yet the San Diego conference would quickly deteriorate into a series of disruptive arguments between the two new commanders, Smith and Rockwell, and the experienced Alaskan leaders, Buckner and DeWitt. As a result, warnings from the Alaskan advisors would not be acted upon, and Buckner's request to employ his own forces would be denied because of Rockwell and Brown's complaints. In the end, they would reach the compromise to hold Buckner's 4th Regiment in reserve at Adak, ready to ship out and hit Atu in less than a day. Finally, on April 18th, as it was revealed that there were at least 1,600 Japanese at Atu, Rockwell decided to commit the entire 7th Division and its reinforcements for Operation Landcrab. Totaling some 10,000 men, Rockwell would have to find the shipping for them somewhere. As a last note, the Americans were planning to send a small team of combat specialists to come up behind the Japanese, tasked with preventing the enemy from falling back into the mountains, where they might hold out for weeks or months. In that regard, Brown would appoint Captain William Willoughby to lead this Provincial Scout Battalion, which would be formed by the 410 top soldiers of the division. Meanwhile, though General Butler had been ordered to saturate the enemy's Aleutian defences with bombs, the 11th Air Force would be grounded for a full week by stinging 100-knot winds and heavy snow. Nonetheless, Butler's forces would fly a total of 1,175 combat sorties in April, though only 4,000 pounds would fall on Atu, as the rest was instead dropped over Kiska, because Atu had the worst foggy weather of all the Aleutian Islands, and because the Americans didn't want to draw attention towards the real objective of the upcoming operation. Finally, on April 24th, the Land Crab Assault Force would set sail in five terribly overcrowded transports with a strong naval escort, so the 7th Division was on its way to bring an end to the Aleutian campaign. Moving on to Burma, we left Brigadier Wingate's forces as they began the last phase of Operation Longcloth, the return to India. After successfully disrupting the Japanese supply lines long enough for the enemy to stop any offensive action against Fort Hertz and the new Lido Road, Wingate had directed his chindits to commence their withdrawal eastwards. Whereas Major Calvert was to take columns 3 and 5 towards the Goktank Gorge to blow up its viaduct, and Colonel Alexander's southern group was to rendezvous with the Kachin guerrillas at Mongmit, Wingate would personally lead columns 7 and 8 to raid Iniwa, one of the main bases of the Burmese independence forces. Arriving at the village of Hluebo on March 18th, Wingate began the crossing of the Irrawaddy River with the aid of skilled native paddlers. He also raided Iniwa in the afternoon, successfully capturing a number of boats and a large junk, which would prove very useful for the river crossing. Concurrently, Major Ferguson's Column 5 had also crossed at Tigyai with the cheerful assistance of the villagers, missing a Japanese retaliation by a hair's breadth. Yet Calvert's Column 3 would be forced to play a game of hide-and-seek with the Japanese on the way to the Irrawaddy, leaving booby traps behind them as they moved. A Japanese force caught up with them as they prepared to cross over just south of Tigyai but a rearguard managed to hold the enemy at bay while the bulk of the column got across. Thus, disaster would be avoided thanks to the sacrifice of a handful of men. Further south, the remnants of the southern group had crossed the river at Tagong on March 10th, then continuing eastwards and replenishing their supplies by air. At this point, Wingate had decided to move to Bor, 
from where he was planning to march to the Qin Hills for subsequent attacks on the Lashio Bamo line. But as the Chindits marched further eastwards, the supply drops started to become less and less frequent, and the amount of wounded men that needed to be carried began to increase. Many of them would have to be left behind as the Japanese pursued them with great pressure. On March 15th, Southern Group would also meet with Calvert's Column 3 near Pegon to exchange information. Despite their original orders to head for Mongmit, Major Dunlop and Colonel Alexander decided to travel to Namkan to cross the Shueli River and escape into China. By March 20th, with the Japanese hard on their heels, the Southern Group further met with Ferguson's Column 5 at the Mbali Chong, and not long after, they would receive orders to continue with the original plans, so they began marching southwards to Mongmit again. There, they were to meet with the Kachin guerrillas by March 20th, but they were already late for the meeting, and so the Kachins would soon leave after waiting for several days. While Southern Group was approaching Mongmit, Columns 3 and 5 were also having trouble finding safe bivouacs, as the Japanese presence in the area had greatly increased. On March 23rd, Kilvert even took on a Japanese company near Mietzai, masterfully ambushing them and successfully inflicting heavy casualties. But after the battle, Wingate was advised that Columns 3 and 5 and Southern Group were losing their effectiveness due to the heat, lack of water and the constant pressure of their pursuers. Thus, he would be ordered to withdraw instead of continuing into the Chin Hills. This forced Wingate to cancel the Goktaik viaduct operation, diverting Calvert to return to India by any route and ordering Ferguson to rejoin the brigade group at Bor. Wingate also decided that a good supply drop was needed and ordered one for March 24th in the paddy fields near the village of Bor, which was held by a Japanese company. Columns 7 and 8 would have to fight their way into the village to recover the supply drop, suffering some casualties as a result. After reuniting with Ferguson's Column 5 at the Hetin Chong by March 26th, Wingate would decide to head back towards Inua, where the enemy least expected them to, and after crossing the river, he planned for his columns to disperse and return back to India individually. The following day, the columns set off across country in a forced march towards Inua, with Column 5 at the rear. Yet on March 28th, as the Japanese were catching up, Ferguson decided to draw the enemy away at Hintha. In the vicious struggle that followed, the column would suffer heavy casualties and would have to disperse in small groups to regroup at anywhere. Wingate would finally reach the Irrawaddy during the early hours of March 29th, but as the Chindits began to cross the river, they got fired upon from the western bank with mortar and automatic fire. Although 65 men from Column 7 would manage to get across and then began tramping westwards away from the river, Wingate would be forced to lead his forces east, back into the jungle, and immediately ordered all columns to disperse, dump all their heavy equipment, and return to India by themselves. Immediately, Wingate divided his own brigade headquarters into five dispersal parties, and he himself would cross the Irrawaddy on April 7th with 43 men and then continue on towards the Chindwin, successfully crossing the railway near the Nankan station with great stealth. After passing Pinlebu, Wingate would finally reach the Chindwin Valley on April 23rd, narrowly escaping capture by a Japanese platoon that was tracking them. Of the other dispersal groups, only one would get to the Chindwin as well, the others getting killed or captured. Meanwhile, far to the south, Dunlop and Alexander's southern group was the farthest away from India. A message from Wingate was clear as to what they should do, but as they arrived late to the meeting at Mongmit on March 31st, and the Japanese were also everywhere in this region fighting with the Chinese Yunnan armies, the southern group had been sent into a death trap. The Gurkhas were caught up with mortar fire on April 1st, but managed to pull out with light casualties, then continuing northeast towards the Shueli River. Arriving there on April 10th, Alexander finally decided to head back to Fort Hertz, yet the Gurkhas would be ambushed once again during the river crossing. This forced them to head to the Irrawaddy instead, using all their stealth to avoid any clashes with the enemy, and thankfully getting the aid of the natives, who gave them food and boats. With low morale and poor strength, they finally crossed the river on April 20th, but were once again attacked by the Japanese during the crossing, 
suffering heavy casualties. Reduced to 350 men, the southern group continued on towards the Mu River, where they were yet again ambushed with mortars on April 28th. After suffering the loss of Colonel Alexander, among many others, Dunlop finally had to lead his exhausted men to the Chindwin, fighting more Japanese patrols as they moved. He would eventually get separated with a small group, finally arriving back at Ork Tong on May 10th. There he learned that Karen guerrillas had thankfully aided 250 of his men to safety. In the meantime, Calvert's Column 3 had gotten to the Shwelly River by March 27th, though the appearance of Japanese patrols would force them to withdraw into the jungles. Because of this, Calvert determined that their best options were to disperse into nine small groups, an order that Wingate later judged as excellent. On March 30th, the groups would finally leave the river in different directions. Thus, eight of the groups would successfully cross the Chindwin in mid-April, and Calvert himself would get to detonate more explosives on the Burmese railway. Only one group would suffer some casualties as it escaped into China. Looking north, Ferguson's Column 5 arrived too late to anywhere, and was already heading to cross the Shwelly River by late March. Only half of the column, some 72 men, got to cross the river though, the rest got captured by the Japanese. Ferguson then led his starving forces to Zibugin, where they obtained some food, and continued northwest, divided in three equal groups. After successfully crossing the Irrawaddy on April 9th, Ferguson would finally reach the Chindwin by April 24th. There he was joined by one of the other groups, though the last one would be captured by the Japanese. As for Major Scott's Column 8, they would head to Fort Hertz and reach the Shwelly on April 1st, yet they would be unable to cross the river, losing around 50 men during their attempts. On April 3rd, as the RAF dropped four dinghies, the column would finally cross the Shwelly by nightfall, then continuing north towards Cather. Yet on April 15th, Scott would finally decide to disperse in six small groups. Two groups would be ambushed and captured almost immediately, but the remaining would rendezvous near Bamo on April 25th, where they received a supply drop. Scott also sent the aviators the message, plane, land, here, now. And on April 28th, a Dakota rescue plane would take 18 wounded men, including Colonel Cook. As another rescue operation would be too dangerous, Scott would head to the Korkwe Chong with his remaining 159 men following in Ferguson's footsteps. On April 30th, during the crossing, the Chindits would be ambushed by Japanese forces, who forced them to disperse and escape. Scott led 57 men to the railway, arriving at Kadu on May 3rd, and finally getting to the Chindwin by May 12th. The remaining 100 men would also thankfully reach the Chindwin by early June. Lastly, Column 7 had been separated into two groups at Inua, those 65 men who crossed the Irrawaddy continued on to India, though they would be repeatedly attacked by the Japanese, and most of them wouldn't reach the Chindwin. The remaining men, under Major Gilks, decided instead to head for China. A small group crossed the Shwelly and got to Fort Hertz, but the main body moved east along the river to join the Kachin guerrillas, who gave them food and helped them cross the Shwelly. On April 25th, Gilks took to the hills towards China with the Japanese in hot pursuit, and by April 30th they had arrived at the Bamo Lashio Road. Aided by local Kachin and Yunnanese villages, Column 7 would finally reunite with the Chinese forces by the end of May. From Kunming, the column would be flown to Assam at once in early June. Thus came the end of Operation Longcloth, the first Chindits expedition. The operation had been very successful in many aspects, as the Japanese supply lines to their back had been completely disrupted, although for a short period of time, and their offensives against the Ledo Road and Fort Hertz had been stopped. But at the same time, many mistakes had been made, and the withdrawal of the Chindits had been a costly endeavour, from which many did not return. These mistakes, however, also taught many painful yet valuable lessons to Wingate and his men which would be very important in the near future. Next episode, we'll head back to the South Pacific to cover Operation Vengeance, an air attack that would forever change the course of the Pacific War. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button.
Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.